Is it on? This hearing of the Subcommittee on Biotechnology, Horticulture, and Research entitled Supply Chain Recovery and Resiliency, Small Producers in Local Agricultural Markets Will Come to Order. Welcome and thank you for joining today's hearing. After brief opening remarks, members will receive testimony from our witnesses today, and then the hearing will be open to questions. Members will be recognized in the order of seniority, alternating between majority and minority members, and in order of the arrival for those members who have joined us after the hearing was called to order. When you are recognized, you will be asked, if you are on video, to unmute your microphone, and we'll have five minutes to ask your questions or make a statement. If you are not speaking, I ask that you remain muted in order to minimize background noise. In order to get as many questions as possible, the timer will stay consistently visible on your screen. I wanna thank my colleagues and our witnesses for joining us today as we host this important discussion on the consequences of, <coughs> excuse me, in recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic on small producers serving local markets. I would also like to welcome you all to the first subcommittee hearing for Biotechnology, Horticulture and Research Subcommittee for the 117th Congress. I'm looking forward to working with all of you and finding ways to address our shared priorities, such as supporting agricultural research, improving and expanding the National Organic Program, and facilitating new developments in agricultural technologies. This subcommittee has jurisdiction over a variety of very exciting and important aspects of our food and agricultural sector, and it's an honor to serve as chair again. The COVID-19 pandemic has undoubtedly had a lasting impact on our agricultural communities around the country, notably impacting small farmers and ranchers, including our small certified organic producers. During the pandemic, producers were required to significantly adapt their business practices and operations to meet the challenges posed by the COVID-19, while shifted how these producers were able to participate in agricultural markets. The pandemic further caused unprecedented interferences within supply chains and challenges to market access from small producers serving local markets local markets which are becoming increasingly more important as a way for producers to add value to their operations. This is true in my own district of the U.S. Virgin Islands. Farmers in the territory are mostly small and local producers who are working to recover from a supply chain disruption. Producers from my district are certainly seeking all opportunities to strengthen their supply chain while serving the local community. Each year, consumers across the country purchase more and more products from local markets. The USDA reported a farm-level value of direct food sales totaling $11.8 billion in 2017, including sales from 18% of US far 8 of U.S. farmers, confirming significant growth in these local agricultural markets. Farmers across the country are taking advantage of this growing demand through a variety of alternative business models and production practices, including direct-to-consumer marketing, farmers markets, community-supported agriculture, community gardens, and food hubs. However, in order to ensure the success of our farmers and producers as demanded for local markets increase, it is vital to examine the impact of COVID-19 on our supply chains and facilitate economic recovery. Our witnesses today include some of those farmers and producers who have seen firsthand the impact of COVID-19 on small farmers, farms servicing local communities. And I'm grateful for their, to hear their experiences, which are crucial to advancing our work here today as we look forward to the next Farm Bill. Without objection, I'd like to include an op-ed that I wrote with the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, which addresses the need for investment in agricultural research and infrastructure, as well as agricultural innovation to the record. Agricultural research and innovation has a far-reaching impact and benefit all producers, including our small, organic, and local producers. I'd now like to welcome the distinguished ranking member, the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Baird, for any opening remarks he would like to give. Well, good morning, and thank you, Chairman Plaskett, for calling this hearing today. 
I'm excited for our subcommittee to come together for the first official hearing of this Congress. And Chair Plaskett, I look forward to developing a fruitful relationship with you as we serve this subcommittee and the very important role its jurisdiction, especially in the areas of biotechnology, research, and extension, plays in the current landscape of the American farm economy. Particularly in regard to the sustainability of the industry, the profitability of our producers, and the stability of our national food supply. And to the members of this subcommittee, I thank you for committing to serve on this panel. I value your leadership and expertise and look forward to serving alongside each of you. I find today's topic to be of particular importance. We're nearing the end of an indiscriminate pandemic that impacted every corner of our lives. The witnesses before us have an opportunity and an important story to tell. And like many of the hearings held thus far in this Congress, their stories add to the narrative that we can do better to prepare for future emergencies. I thank our witnesses for their time and participation in today's discussion. Of course, I regret that we can't gather in person today, but I appreciate the work that you have done to put into preparing your thoughts and look forward to hearing more about your operations and experiences. Our nation is home to a varied yet immensely productive agricultural industry. On one hand, we have a group of developed larger farms that play a most critical role in the stability of our food supply chain. Operations leverage the efficiencies gained by economies of scale to provide our nation the cheapest, safest, and most abundant food supply chain the world has ever known. They bolster national security and stabilize agricultural markets. On the other hand, we have a group of smaller producers, often they're passionately serving niche markets or in the beginning phases of their operations, working to build markets and equity. Both of these groups represent American farmers. Both represent a crucial component of our nation's food supply chain and its security. Both experience unique challenges that occasionally rely on policy solutions to improve. Beginning farmers in the United States face significant challenges in entering production. Those without prior experience or land to inherit or large sums of capital have presented with sometimes insurmountable difficulties to begin their operation, let alone to be competitive after they are established. These obstacles for some small farmers significantly hinder the ability to bring younger generations into agriculture and to diversify our nation's agricultural production. I also think there's ample opportunity for the department to improve outreach and engage for those entering into agriculture. Through today's discussion, I look forward to hearing more about these producers and how they overcame their myriad of various challenges including those set on or aggravated by the COVID-19 pandemic. I also hope to hear how we as policymakers can better serve small or beginning farmers, what policies we need to work on, where we can start over, how we ultimately can ensure that agriculture remains a highly desired industry. As I said, I'm excited about our work and the work ahead. I sincerely look forward to today's testimony and thank you again, Madam Chair, for calling this hearing. I yield back. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Ranking Member. The Chair would request that other members submit their opening statements for the record so witnesses may begin their testimony and to ensure that there is ample time for questioning. I'm pleased to welcome such a distinguished panel of witnesses to our hearing today. Our witnesses bring to the hearing a wide range of experience and expertise, and I thank you for joining us. Our first witness today is Mr. Dale Brown. He and his wife, Yvette Brown, are the owners of Seja Farm, which is located on the island of St. Croix in the U.S. Virgin Islands. He raises goats, sheep, and chickens, and farms a variety of organic produce. He is an advocate for locally sourced produce and meat and supports educational programs for young farmers, cooking with locally sourced food and agritourism. He co-founded the Virgin Islands Farmers Cooperative with his wife. 
<clears throat> Our next witness is Ms. Perry Cooper, who is the executive director of the Georgia Organic Peanut Association. In addition to her work at there, she is the director of the Flint River Soil and Water Conservation District and a beginning farmer in Sumter County, Georgia. She has a degree in agri-science and environmental system and a certificate in local food systems. To introduce our third witness, I'm pleased to yield to our colleague on the subcommittee and chairman of the Subcommittee on Commodity Exchanges, Energy and Credit, the distinguished gentleman from New York, Mr. Delgado. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Plaskett. It is my privilege and honor to introduce uh, our next witness and my constituent, uh, Tiana Kennedy. Uh, Tiana Kennedy is the owner of the 607 Community Supported Agriculture, CSA, uh, and owner and farmer at Star Route Farm, one of nearly 5,000 uh, farms uh, in my district. Uh, the, C the 607 CSA is a multi-farm operation in the Northern Catskills region. Uh, the CSA supports four vegetable farms, partners with more than 35 additional neighboring farms and food businesses, and serves 800 families in the Catskills and New York City. Star Route Farm is a small scale, diversified vegetable, herb, and small grain farm. Ms. Kennedy also serves on my bipartisan, locally based agriculture advisory committee. She has an important perspective on the role small scale farmers play in local agricultural markets and supply chain resiliency. The COVID-19 pandemic has made even more clear that we must empower and support our local producers to prevent supply chain disruptions. I'm proud that New York's 19th Congressional District is represented here today by Ms. Kennedy. Ms. Kennedy, it is good to see you. I look forward to hearing your testimony and learning more about how Congress can best support you and other farmers like you in the future. I yield back. I thank the gentleman to introduce our fourth witness. I'm pleased to yield to the ranking member of the subcommittee, the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Baird. Thank you, Madam Chair. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce Jonathan and Kelly Shannon to testify before us today. Jonathan and Kelly are niche market livestock producers and live on a 10 acre farm in rural Montgomery County, Indiana, along with their three daughters, where they raise cattle, pigs, chickens, and goats. Jonathan and Kelly started Shannon Family Farms in 2006 and have continually changed their commodities that they raise to meet the needs of their consumers. In 2016, they partnered with other farm families in the area to form the Four Seasons Local Market located in downtown Crawfordsville. They did this to create year-round opportunities to sell local products to their community. In addition to their work on the farm and with the local market, Jonathan and Kelly both have jobs off the farm and are actively involved in the Montgomery County Farm Bureau and the Indiana Farm Bureau. I am honored to have both of you with us today and I look forward to you sharing your story with this committee. And with that, I yield back. Thank the, I thank the gentleman for his remarks. We welcome all of our witnesses today and will now proceed to hearing your testimony. You will each have five minutes and the timer should be visible to you on your screen and will count down to zero at which time and which point your time has expired, please, uh, so that we can get to the questions for so many of our members which are with us both here in the um, hearing room and with us virtually. Mr. Brown, please begin when you are ready. Unmute Good and morning. give our, your testimony. Thank you, sir. Good morning and thanks for the invite, Chair. Mr. Brown, do you have, um, are you visible to yes, show I'm, yourself? Yes, I'm visible, but I am I'm doing both uh, uh, screen and phone for video. Okay, excellent, thank you. Good morning again, and I, I thank you, Chair, for inviting me to this uh, hearing. My testimony is going to be brief, but punctual. It is my pleasure to, to be here to testify <coughs> on the supply chain recovery resiliency, small producer and local agricultural market. My testimony will reflect the impact of natural disaster, COVID-19, and programs offered by USDA during the pandemic on our islands. And to couple with that, the 
local government leadership not being totally involved or not being involved at all in any of our agricultural development. I'm an advocate for the resurgence of Virgin Islands agriculture, developing a local food system, and ultimately food security is a challenge. However, it is one I'm willing to take on and to make sure we have an agricultural resurgence in the territory. Diverse, diversifying our farm over the years has helped us to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 pandemic. And this has provided an opportunity for us to bring the awareness of local food in the territory. COVID-19 pandemics has negatively impacted um, and has taken a role in the operation of the farm. But we had to operate in new ways and it has created an additional burden to our overhead costs. There has also been a sudden change in sales volume, real-time decision-making, labor productivity, and the threat of its true risk in all parts of it. There was a loss in income to crop and livestock due to COVID-19. Crop did not get to market as before the pandemic. Our farm programs were halted. Less patrons and closure of restaurants. Chef unable to meet have scheduled group dining, catering, supermarkets, not taking large quantity of produce, all due to the pandemic. Livestock sales cease due to VI, the, the VI Department of Agriculture Abattoir extended closure due to maintenance and, and the pandemic. In addition, we seize our livestock production and herd of both sheep and goats were separated to avoid any further breeding, breeding production. The following income generation programs were halted or lowered due to the pandemic from 2019 until present. Our community supported agriculture, which actually we have about 20 members partaking in that uh, agriculture program during every season. Uh, our Bush Cook Chef Cook, which is a culinary event, is held on the farm every year. Uh, that we could not have take up our signal contractual program which service over 2,000 employees between all three islands we're unable to to meet that and our youth summer program which is bridging the gap uh, we was unable to also meet that just as well one thing that we I have observed is that the USDA programs which we do have which is the NRCS equip programs those programs has changed after our drought and it even continued during the pandemic where the changes that was there was that the, you receive the contract and you begin working on the contract for reimbursement but unfortunately after the drought and uh the hurricanes we have an issue where now we are asked or we are told that we have to actually look for our own engineers and complete the project at the same time. So reimbursement for excess spending was not involved. In addition, uh, the equip program is 90% reimbursement. The cost of products coming from the mainland is higher than by the time it gets here. So there is no mitigation and we have to actually foot that cost and remain with the, the, the reimbursement that we are allowed by contracts. To give a simple example, in one of our contracts for a waste management facility, $57 was the, the, the total amount. And therefore it costs us over $400 to complete it. Reimbursement was only $57. Uh, FSA programs are available for livestock during the drought, but yet still there are some programs that are not most effective to us here in the territory. Thank you so much, Mr. Brown. Um, during questioning, I'm sure we'll be able to uh, understand some additional issues with that. Ms. Cooper? Please begin when you are ready. Chair Plaskett, Ranking Member Baird, and Subcommittee members, thank you for allowing me to testify before you today. 
My name is Perry Cooper. I'm incredibly lucky to work with a diverse set of agricultural stakeholders. I have the privilege to work as the executive director of the Flint River Soil and Water Conservation District in Southwest Georgia, and I'm also the director of the Georgia Organic Peanut Association, a farmer-owned agricultural cooperative that markets USDA-certified organic peanuts and other agricultural products from producers in the Southeast. GOPA has continued to grow both in number and farmers since incorporation, but growth, growth has not been without challenges. Without a certified organic supply chain, once peanuts leave the farm, they lose certified organic products and the associated price premium. Certified organic production made up 0.06% of Georgia's total peanut production last year, which is nowhere near the volume to achieve the added value for the shelling, blanching, and roasting facilities to go through the certification process. Certified organic production must be done at a smaller scale. GOPA works with one certified organic shelling facility and one certified organic blanching facility, which is limiting and risky. In 2019, when the cooperative formally incorporated, the one certified organic peanut sheller was still inoperative from Hurricane Michael in October 2018, our first experience with issues of a limited supply chain. This past year, post-harvest processing was so bottlenecked that we have only in the past week been able to sell the first part of our 2020 crop. That's a long gap for us to pay farmers for their crop without the ability to sell it. Investment specifically in rural infrastructure to support local supply chains is critical. For certified organic supply chains, this includes support and incentives for certification. While GOPA has been able to tap into several local markets within Georgia, expanding into small and mid-scale markets, both within the Southeast and outside of peanut producing regions has been an obstacle. In fact, last year, GOPA's chairman was on a plane to California to attend a natural products expo when the event was canceled due to COVID. GOPA also has a great demand for, but cannot serve local direct to consumer requests. GOPA submitted an unsuccessful 2020 FMPP proposal to explore a pathway for roasting, packaging, marketing to meet these direct consumer demands. While the positive feedback was hopeful, reviewers didn't fully understand the supply chain and commodity production basics. We've seen this pattern repeat for other regional commodity markets, such as another rejected LFPP grant in Southeast Georgia, focused on small to mid-scale blueberry supply chain development to serve local markets. Feedback included similar misunderstandings of small rural supply chains. Projects focused in rural areas, specifically areas of persistent poverty, should be a priority funding area for LAMP programs. And geographic representation and transparency on review panels to ensure there is rural and farmer representation is critical. GOPA has also applied for a value-added producer grant to expand to unmet markets. The reduced cost share requirement through COVID-19 relief funding made the opportunity within reach during a time of production bottleneck. In the regular value-added producer process, recipients have to spend money for a 50% reimbursement. This can require significant cash flow that can be limiting. I urge the subcommittee con to consider permanent reduced cost share requirements for this program for eligible groups, such as socially disadvantaged and beginning farmers and small farmer cooperatives. GOPA also aims to continue to grow the supply to meet this demand by providing an entry point into agriculture for new and beginning farmers in rural areas. My husband and I wouldn't have been able to take the leap into starting our own farm business without the mentorship and market support we found through the farmer network within GOPA. In 2020, GOPA received a beginning farmer rancher development planning grant to, support, to develop a formal mentorship model and aims to provide other direct to support to member farmers. Farmers are resilient. In the face of natural disaster, extreme weather events, fluctuating markets, and now a global pandemic, resilience in the supply chain is critical and it starts at the farm level. Small, big, conventional, organic, local, global, this principle holds true across the board. That without stewardship of our natural resources and building healthy and sustainable farms, local agricultural economies suffer, supply chains suffer. Investing in conservation research and on-farm conservation programs is a win for all of agriculture. Research funding through USDA NEFA, SARE, conservation innovation grants through NRCS are all critical for the development of proven and farmer trusted practices and technologies that promote conservation and improve farm profitability and efficiency. Programs that offset costs to adopt these practices such as EQIP, RCPP, and CRP are also critical. My work through the Soil and Water Conservation District has allowed me to see firsthand the direct on-farm benefit of several of these programs. Our supply chain should value the environmental benefits of farms that meaningfully implement conservation practices and directly reward farmers for conservation and sustainability. If there's one thing I have learned in the last 16 months is that our supply chains are not virtual. We can't farm from home. I'm excited to be a part of a community in South Georgia that aims to emerge from these challenges stronger than before 
with clear opportunities for improvement and appreciate the subcommittee's interest and dedication to enhancing the strength and resiliency of our local supply chains. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cooper. Ms. Kennedy, please begin. Thank you for this opportunity to share my experiences as a young farmer today. I know that you all received a copy of the testimony, so I'll just focus on a couple of quick things. Um, but before I do that, I'd also just like to talk about the resiliency, strength, and innovation of all of us small-scale producers, such as the other witnesses and myself, and in order to encourage you to adopt your programs to our needs. Um, my name is Tiana Kennedy. I operate a full-diet multi-farm CSA that last year served 800 families in New York City and in the Catskills, but we also work with 50 restaurants and grocers and 21 pantries and food justice organizations throughout New York. I also grow mixed vegetables and small grains on 60 rented acres at Star Route Farm in Charlotteville, New York. I've been farming in Delaware and Otsego counties in New York for over a decade. My experience farming has been shaped by lack of access to secure farmland to grow my business. I apprenticed first at a large vegetable operation for three years, but I was burdened by student loan debt and I was making a farmer's age wages, so I wasn't able to buy a business, my own farm right away. So I helped a second homeowner start his organic farm on his property, but when he pivoted his business model, I lost my job in my home and had to start from scratch again. So finally, I found a, a farm partner willing to form an LLC with me, and we rented 60 acres and broke ground on our current farm, Star Route Farm, which I now run with Walter Reason and Amanda Wong. But because we only had a 10-year lease on that farm, we are unable to put in permanent fencing and build out an adequate wash pack cooler station so we lose about 30% of our vegetables to deer annually and can't scale our business due to lack of cooler space and storage space. Um, this past winter, we were finally able to purchase our neighbor's property with the help of local farm fund investors, but the property is, is an old conventional dairy. It has a dilapidated, actually collapsed barn and farmhouse. It'll take years to rebuild and transition to organic production. However, despite all these challenges um, and despite access to land and access to capital until this year. I've worked collaboratively with other farms throughout my region to develop creative solutions to these challenges. Um, to mitigate, mitigate risk and create market advantage to my own farm, I can miss my farmer's market buddies to join me in a multi-farm CSA venture we call the 607 CSA. It now grows 30 to 50% annually. The CSA serves as an integral part of concept for an organization that can fill in the logistics gaps and address the needs of regional small agriculture. Last year before our normal season began, we were faced with the COVID-19 pandemic. Our whole business had to change in an instant. Within two weeks, we had fully, a fully operational business with 45 local farms and food mis businesses delivering, home delivering to 40 Catskills towns. So I'm proud of the work that we were able to do in scaling up to support the community. We had to take on all of the risk and weren't able to meet the actual demand at hand because we lacked funding to purchase emergency relief food from our farmers or even to pay our staff adequately. Everybody was volunteering time to drive food to people's homes. For myself and other farm businesses who share my needs, I want to offer these recommendations for the committee today. CSAs are an important part of the piece of the puzzle, especially for young and beginning farmers, so it'd be great to support them. Our member farmers need help with strategic planning and identifying new opportunities. Congress could help by funding outreach and technical assistance to regional food businesses and organizations, organizations such as myself to formalize and scale. For us, it's time to purchase or lease a refrigerated truck and our own pallet jack or two. There's not a USDA program that allows for a lot of this kind of in infrastructure development beyond FSA microloans. So I'd love to see items like this included in programs like VAPG, the local food product promotion program and the regional food systems partnerships. We need streamlined access and accessible USDA programs. The application process is burdensome and extremely academic. It's its own culture. The applications are often timed during our busiest season, June, and require burdensome funding matches, as my other witnesses, my colleagues, have, have explicated. The match requirements can also exclude smaller projects and historically underserved communities that do not have access to this sort of funding. It would help to have USDA prioritize LAMP grant applications that serve targeted communities like those of beginning farmers and BIPOC producers. To get the word out about key SD, USDA programs, USDA needs dedicated outreach staff to, and to enter into more cooperative agreements to do outreach. Finally, the Farmers to Families Food Box program in the pandemic showed what is possible when the USDA invests in connecting farmers with food and secure communities. We need to continue this type of government support. The first round of funding was accessible to small farmers and small distributors and paid these entities a good price to sell to those in need. 
in the future, more long-term programs like this could be created. I and I suggest that if they are, they a, reserve dedicated funds for BIPOC nonprofits and food businesses, consider removing gap requirements so smaller producers can, can contribute, because remember a lot of people are using rented land, and publish best practices guide to recruit BIPOC and young farmer distributors for, for participating in the program. I wanna note that however inaccessible USA programs can be, they're harder for, for people that don't have the resources I do. Um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much for that. And Mr. Shannon, please begin when you are ready. Chairwoman Plaskett, Ranking Member Baird, thank you for allowing us to join this discussion today. Uh, Kelly and I are both fully involved in our day-to-day -day operations of our small niche livestock market uh, in town, where those products end up in the end consumer's hand throughout our community and beyond. Uh, we have submitted some written testimony and like to just cover some of the highlights from there and tell a little bit of our story. Kelly returned to rural Montgomery County in 2003 after graduating college. And a year later, I joined her by purchasing our 10 acre farm, less than one mile from where she grew up. As most farm families, land and profits were too tight to add more family members to the operation. So we both took off farm jobs. As time passed, we were forced to find what our niche was to make our farm profitable. At the young age of 26, we began Shannon Family Farms with little knowledge of our local markets or opportunities available through the USDA. The goal was to produce proteins for local consumers and provide buying options for the community. A few years later, 70 adjoining acres came available to us. As beginning teachers on beginning teacher salaries, many lending, lending institutions would not even entertain a conversation about purchasing those 70 acres. So we were not able to attain that land and had to regroup and decide how will we be most profitable on 10 acres. We had no knowledge of beginning farmers or ranchers loans to the USDA at that time, but would self fund our 10 acres and become profitable. We would become a beef, pork, poultry, and egg producer and deal with the end consumer. From 20, 2006 to 2016, we formed our own agricultural market through our on-farm sales, through attending farmers markets in surrounding areas and working with Indiana Grown through the Indiana State Department of Agriculture. Finally, in 2016, we hit a roadblock with market opportunities. Based on this dilemma, we could continue being a small producer or expanding into a year round retail business model. Thankfully, there were other like-minded producers in the community that faced some of the same barriers and we made an effort to find a solution to those reduced market opportunities. Ranking member Baird mentioned that we started Four Seasons Local Market. That is a cooperative of a few small producers for a year round retail storefront that sits on Main Street in historic downtown Crawfordsville. We offer locally produced products from the community and across the state. This market is vibrant and a weekly meeting, meeting place of local food consumers who purchase products from local farm families. Our official interactions with the USDA began in July 2020, almost 14 years after we began our small operation. The reason for the encounter was for the coronavirus food assistance program during COVID-19. Why had it taken us 14 years to discover some of the economic opportunities available through the USDA? We believe that services were mostly offered and benefited large row crop or large livestock operations that did not help small producers. Our experience both through CPAP phases at the local FSA office were easy and beneficial. Earlier, I mentioned partnerships with Indiana Grown. That included the Indiana Grown for Schools Network, which is a statewide initiative to get products of local producers into the schools. That grant was through the Indiana State Department of Health, Indiana State Department of Agriculture and Purdue Extension. It funded creation of a website and buyer's guide so that people would have opportunity to purchase. We have not been able to take advantage of this opportunity and it is our belief that the USDA could be of assistance by incentivizing schools to use more individual ingredients and less prepared and prepackaged foods. As other livestock producers 
experienced during COVID, we had a bottleneck in our processing. There are grants that have recently been made available, including uh, the readiness grant, meat and poultry inspection readiness grant, uh, to hopefully, to hopefully um, prevent future bottlenecks. We have been able to give up a few of our staple proteins, uh, grass-fed beef and pasture-raised poultry, and have had to move and change with consumer demand. At this time, uh, our increased e-commerce opportunities are there, but as many others have found, we have um, not benefited from high-speed internet in our rural area. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of our witnesses for those statements. At this time, members will be recognized for questions in order of seniority, alternating between majority and minority members. <clears throat> You'll be recognized for five minutes, e each in order to allow us to get to as many questions as possible. Uh, I recognize myself for five minutes at this time. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, Ms. Kennedy, would you speak to the role that consumers play in local agricultural markets? And how did the change in consumer demand impact farmers' business decisions and drive innovation in local markets during the COVID pandemic? Yes, I'd love to. Um, I think that our uh, ranking member, as ranking member Baird mentioned, us small farmers usually have to find niche markets. And so usually we're just trying to fill in the gaps of the big guys. But during the COVID pandemic, when the larger supply chains were threatened and the grocery stores were bare, we became the market. Mm. Um, most of my producers did not have, I mean, the restaurants closed and, and so we lost one market, but everybody else that I knew was scaling up and struggling to meet demand. And so I feel like we all had to pivot in, in a moment's notice to try to meet those demands, to try to feed our, our, our members, our, our neighbors and people that we had never worked with before. So um, yeah, during, during emergency moments, the small scale producers sort of take the burden of the whole food system, but lack the support to, um, to pivot and to make those changes and just take all the risk. And, and then this year, once the pandemic is sort of easing off, everybody goes back to business as normal and forgets that mm -hmm. last year they were depending on us for their lives. So that, so that has also a challenge because then everybody has scaled up and now we have, um, now we have to find other avenues for the food. Thank so, you. Thank you for that. that. Question? Uh, yes. Mr. Shannon, would you agree with what Ms. Kennedy has just outlined? Chairwoman, I, I was sitting here shaking my head on every point Mrs. Kennedy made that uh, we had record sales through the months of March 2020 and also April 2020. Uh, store shelves were empty. We ramped up dealing with livestock. It's a little lengthier process to ramp up. Um, but as things came back to normal, sales and those consumers have started to disappear uh, out of local food. But yes, we did take the, the brunt and were able to support our local community and make sure they had proteins in their freezers and refrigerators throughout the pandemic. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Brown, thank you for joining us. And can you speak towards the unique market access challenges that come with farming on an island uh, off of the mainland? Thank you. Yes. Um, we are in a, one of the most unfortunate circumstances, and that's because our input is almost 98 or 99%. So in a time of uh, supply, where food was being halted during the, the pandemic, we saw some changes, but we had to make changes as well. And put the protocol in place in order to, to uh, to mitigate what was happening. Uh, most of our wholesale production were lost. And those channels that you use, such as the supermarkets and other uh, restaurants, were actually not taking anything at that time. 
Now, we have to actually adapt in a way where we have to serve a certain amount of customers at a time. And even though, like the other testifier said, we had increased sales, but then as we go along, we find that it tapers off. So we are looking for over the last six months where it has, it has tapered off, where the, everything seems to be getting back to normal. And we are now back at the same place. Instance, our local department of agriculture, which, which actually process meat, has been closed for the last six weeks. And prior and during the pandemic, it's been closed for almost a whole year. So we had a situation where uh, we had to stop our meat CSA and only deal with the produce CSA. So customers were asking for, for protein, but unfortunately we could not provide it because we are doing commercial sale of protein and not to go against the law itself to have um, protein produced or, or processed through some other method. Thank, thank you. I've run out of time, but I want to thank you, Mr. Brown, also for your promotion of local farming and educating young farmers, and would love to see your written testimony about that as well. Um, at this time, um, Mr. Ranking Member Baird. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Shannon, uh, in your testimony, you mentioned difficulties you faced uh, of, of obtaining capital to pursue your business plan. <coughs> You know, I've seen through my years, time and again, the near impossibility for a beginning farmer to begin and run an operation that was large enough uh, to support his family. So my question to you is, how do you suggest and recommend young people go about this process? And what steps should they take to be prepared uh, to try to start their operation? Mr. Shannon. Thank you, sir. Um, I was I was encouraged uh, the other day looking through some of the USDA programs that there are youth loans available. And what popped into my head were my two daughters that have an interest in agriculture and finding out ways of how they could add to the farm that is unique to them. Um, what we were really missing uh, starting out back in 2006 um, was some succession planning or a mentor, some guidance for young beginning farmers on what has worked, what has not worked. Uh, so teaming up with that mentor that may be a, a seasoned farmer looking to retire eventually, uh, to pass that along, uh, to give advice and get you going on the straight and narrow uh, to be profitable. Um, so I believe finding that mentor, whether that is in your local community, anywhere across the country, having that network of folks to give guidance. Uh, something else that we ran into was business essentials, grant writing, legalities with business entities, health departments, accounting, federal tax reg registration. All of that uh, could be part uh, of the USDA stepping up and providing those resources and guidance, whether that is through uh, classes, outreach, uh, but having that so you, that you are prepared uh, early on in your career as a beginning farmer uh, to gain that capital and make those best choices. If I may continue on that conversation just a little bit uh, with you, uh, you mentioned the resources of the USDA, but uh, you also mentioned that you worked with uh, the Indiana Department of Agriculture, uh, and many states have departments of agriculture. Uh, can, you, uh, can you share with this committee how you got involved with the Indiana Grown and how it helped you enter into even more markets? Yes, uh, we were attending the conference at some at one point early on and Indiana Grown uh, was just in its infancy. I believe around 2015, Indiana Grown began and they came to present and the goal was to have a network of Indiana farmers, uh, Indiana produce products, and share those successes and open markets. Um, we are in a frozen processed meat business. Uh, Indiana Grown worked tirelessly for other producers to get them on the shelves. But again, frozen meat in a grocery store is difficult. 
there has been much success with other local producers getting in uh, grocery store shelves. Uh, Indiana Grown has put on events that we were able to attend and get our face, our name, our story in front of consumers. So we have benefited from their um, statewide network, um, mentoring with other folks uh, later in our career, and being able to, like I said, have that story, have our product in front of a larger audience. And it's all concentrated at the state house and has a good look, a good message that goes out to uh, the community in the state. Thank you. I only have about a minute left, but uh, many states have programs like Indiana Grown uh, to support state products. So have any of the other witnesses been able to work with their state departments of agriculture to help enter the local markets? And if so, uh, please feel free to comment. We got about 40 seconds. If Dale Brown, if I may comment, that is one of our biggest challenges here in the territory because the Virgin Islands Department of Agriculture has become so much dysfunctional. Uh, it's hard for us to actually use that time or have that engagement with the department in reaching other markets. So we are like in a catch-22 position that we have to do it ourselves, totally. Thank you, and uh, I thank our witnesses again for being here. I appreciate all of their uh, efforts, and I yield back. Thank you very much. Um, our next member is Mr. Delgado. Mr. Delgado. Mr. Delgado, um, if not, we'll move to Ms. Schreier of Washington State. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to our witnesses. Uh, I want to focus on how the federal government can better support small and medium-sized family farms. Uh, right now, we subsidize farm production in a manner that really benefits most uh, the largest corporate farms in the country. And I've heard from small and medium-sized producers in my district in Washington State that significant barriers exist for them to participate in USDA purchasing programs and local markets. And these need to be addressed. <clears throat> Better supporting market access for family farms will help farmers at themselves, it will shrink the carbon footprint of agricultural production, reduce transportation needs, and lead to healthier diets locally, uh, in particular in our schools. And I know that the pandemic dramatically disrupted life throughout the country, leaving millions struggling to feed themselves and their families. Uh, and yet, federal, early federal aid was heavily weighted toward larger farms and corporations because their scale allowed for efficient distribution in a national program. Many specialty crop producers and smaller family-run operations suffered tremendously, and at a time when more people than ever were facing hunger, small and medium farms had nowhere to send their food. And at a time when our food supply chains were collapsing, uh, local family farms were in many ways left out. Uh, that's why I introduced several bills, including the Farmers Feeding Families Coronavirus Response Act, the Food and Farm Emergency Assistance Act, and the Farming Support to States Act to assist local growers and producers. And these bills aim to move the management of the food supply chains to the states, since state Department of Agriculture have existing relationships with local small and medium farmers, provide emergency grants to assist growers and producers in covering significant costs incurred as a result of the pandemic, and one of the bill would have uh, provided grants to cover PPE and supplies to convert operations like refrigeration or packaging goods for individual consumers as opposed to restaurants. Um, and I'm really glad to hear that my colleague, Mr. Baird, brought up this very issue of how state departments of agriculture can help our smaller producers. I was excited to see the recent announcement from the USDA that it will invest a billion dollars to purchase nutritious food 
for state food bank networks from local and regional producers. This announcement mirrors many of the proposals in the bills I just mentioned. And it is vital for those who are administering federal programs to have relationships with local small producers and food banks in order to better support the local economies and target distribution. Um, now, several of you mentioned that the Farmers to Families Food Box program did not adequately benefit small producers. And Ms. Cooper, I have a question for you. Can you tell me about your experience with the Food Box program and share any insights into how the USDA can ensure small farms are able to participate in this latest round of USDA funding as well as future programs? And are there some barriers at USDA that we here should be looking to, to fix? Thanks so much. And um, I, I did in my written testimony, I uh, mentioned a little bit about uh, the, the food box program and in our experience with it um, and couldn't fit it into five minutes. Um, but um, we actually uh, in, in Southwest Georgia, you know, um, when, when you think of small food infrastructure, there are some more urban areas in the northern part of our state that um, were really well suited for this. This wasn't true for my area. Um, despite uh, Albany, which is in Southwest Georgia, being a, a nationally recognized top three hotspot during the pandemic on a per capita basis. Um, through my work with the Soil and Water Conservation District, we actually launched our own food box program um, to, to supplement federal and, and state efforts. Uh, so through the nonprofit arm, we worked with local farmers um, and also with our network of nonprofit community garden spaces to source local produce and then partnered with local restaurant businesses that had been hit by the pandemic and, and through funds raised here locally purchased hot meals from those locally owned restaurants. Um, so we had both produce boxes and hot meals and delivered them to folks in need, working again with local businesses and our Thank local you. community. Thank you. That's identify. incredibly resourceful. I appreciate that. I just want to mention two other things. One is the heat wave hitting the Northwest that has mm -hmm. really worried our farmers about crop losses, particularly the uh, tree fruit industry and specialty crops. And second, that labor continues to be a huge challenge for farmers in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, we desperately need reform, and I would encourage the Senate to pass our Farm Workforce Modernization Act, which I wholeheartedly supported. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you so much for that. Uh, as we can see throughout our country, hearing from um, Mr. Brown, uh, you discussing, Ms. Schreier, that farmers are on the front line of so much of the climate issues that we have in our country, and we've got to support them to be able to overcome those and continue producing. They're so vitally important to us. I noted um, uh, our ranking member, Mr. Thompson, was with us earlier, um, but right now I would like to um, call on Mr. Scott uh, for his testimony. Mr. Scott of Georgia, but I always say the younger Scott, right? Fair enough. Scott the younger. Fair enough. <laughs> it, uh, thank you. And I want to talk a little, briefly about the supply chain just a little bit, and I, I can't talk about this without reminding just the American public that's watching. The American farmer gets a little less than 10 cents of every dollar that you're spending at the grocery store, uh, probably uh, even less than that um, right now. The increased cost of transportation and, and what is happening with inflation at the grocery store, the American farmer is not, not seeing that revenue. I went to the local grocery store on uh, this past weekend and tended to buy steak. I passed over the steak because it simply uh, cost way too much. I looked at the pork and the pork was unbelievably high and I ended up with uh, $5 worth of chicken that I think I paid 7 or $8 for. And so when we talk about supply chain, it, it's, not, it's not limited to the farmer. The American consumer is feeling, is feeling the, the brunt of this when, when they walk into the grocery store. And I want, I want you to know if, as the consumer that the American farmer is not benefiting from the price increases that you're seeing. So uh, one of the issues as we talk about supply chain uh, that I never thought of is the issue of boxes. I think about seed, I think about chemicals, I think about uh, transportation. Uh, but I got, a, I got a call the other day from a farmer saying, guess what? We've got a, we've got a field, uh, a, a crop that's grown, and we can't get the boxes to harvest it and put it into transport. And so I thought I might share with you this aspect of what happens in the supply chain. Do you have 11 by 12s? That's the size of a box. This is a text message from a 
producer to a, a box supplier. I'll have some in a few days. We're out of boxes and can't get labor. I'm supposed to have some coming in from Honduras at the end of the week. Having to source boxes from Honduras. What do you have, 11 by 11s? No, I'm out of everything right now. I don't know what to tell you. We're having major supply chain and labor problems. And so is, and he names uh, another company that I'll uh, skip. All, all the crate manufacturers are out of crates, and RPC and echo boxes are non-existent. Uh, this is something that the American farmer is just starting to feel. Uh, there were enough to, to cover the producers, I think, in Florida for their, their fruit and vegetables, but now as the uh, harvest is coming into Georgia and the, the other states, uh, we, we may very well see a shortage of fruit and vegetables on the shelves because of um, supply chain issues with boxes. But the American consumer's buying habits have changed. Uh, and I want to go to, to Ms. Cooper from Georgia. I spent a lot of time at the Cordial Farmers Market when I was a much younger man, uh, as did most of the members of my family. The, um, it, it, it used to be that you would go to the farmer's market, you would buy your fruit and your, ve your, your vegetables, I should say, not your fruit, fruit and you would uh, um, <coughs> shuck the corn and cut it off the cob, put it in the freezer and everything else. And the American consumer has changed. Uh, but you mentioned programs, not, not only the beginning young farmers. In Georgia, we have Georgia Grown. We've got farmers market promotion programs. What, what can we do to influence the consumer buying habits to encourage them to go to the farmers markets in, in other ways that they can buy directly from the farmer so that the farmer can get more than 10 cents out of the dollar that the American consumer is spending? And I know farmers from your area that actually uh, carry their product all the way to the Atlanta farmers market because they don't feel like they have the volume of customers at, at the local farmer markets there. So just looking for your input there. I know you do a lot with organics, but uh, obviously that's a specialty market and you have to have the, the volume of customers as well. So any input there would be appreciated. Yes, sir. Thank you, Congressman Scott. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I farm in, in Sumter County, which is a, a really large green bean producing county in our state. And one thing that we observed um, this past year is that these large green bean packing houses that, like you said, are typically sending things up to Atlanta to serve larger urban markets, they, they started opening their doors for local residents to come in and, and pick up a couple pounds of green beans from the farmer down the road that had been sending everything up um, to a larger urban market. Um, and this is true for, for your question, but also for, for peanuts and, and some of the, you know, the commodity supply chains that are on a small scale in a niche market. There just needs to be a scale appropriate infrastructure so that farmers don't feel the pressure to go to these larger markets. Um, for, for peanuts, we handle 2,000 pound totes, which is the industry standard, but we get calls and emails all the time of people asking, how can I get five pounds of raw peanuts from you, which we can't do because we just don't have this, this proper um, infrastructure. Well, my, my time has expired, but this is an important meeting. The supply chain issues are something that we witnessed the, the um, fragility of this past year. And, and Madam Chair, while, uh, while I think we did some things to help, I think, it's, I think it's very much still there. I yield. Thank you very much, Mr. Scott. Uh, this time we call on Congresswoman Pingree of Maine to, for her five minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you uh, to you and the ranking member both for your opening remarks and uh, for, for having this hearing today. As I think everyone before me has said, this is a really timely hearing. Um, unfortunately, the pandemic provided so many challenges, but it really showed us the difficulties with the uh, supply chain, but also some opportunities for the very farmers we have with us today and the small to medium sized farmers they represent. Um, it's certainly been uh, an issue that I've focused a lot of my work in agriculture around, and I'm really pleased that we have this chance to talk about how we um, support more programs at the USDA and, and think about tailoring programs to the small to medium sized farmer, to developing more infrastructure to support the very concerns people are talking about today, technical assistance, loan availability, um, more value added products, getting more from the market, as Mr. Scott said, making sure everybody makes more than 10 cents on the dollar, which is possible when you can direct retail. So um, there's just so many things you all have discussed. So I thank you to all of the, the people who are testifying for us today because your personal stories really bring it home, I think, to all the members of the committee. 
Um, so let me just see if I can fit in a few questions here and stop talking. Um, to Ms. Kennedy and Ms. Cooper, um, you both mentioned in your testimony that you applied for USDA local food promotion grants, but had not been successful. So we all work on supporting these programs, and then we're very discouraged when there's either not enough money or um, the programs that we think should be serving um, the very needs that you've mentioned um, aren't available. So um, could you talk a little bit about that? And actually, before I, I mention that, I, I want to say that I, I personally have been operating a small farm that has many of the same challenges that you all do, but um, in particular, Ms. Kennedy, if I could get rid of all the deer that interfere with my ability to harvest the crop, uh, that would be my number one pet peeve, and you just can't buy enough fencing sometime to keep them all out. So, But could you two talk a little bit about the application process and the challenges that you faced um, so we can make sure we're really thinking about how the, the money from those programs get to the very needs you're talking about? Sure, I'd love to start if I may. Um, I So I, I'm also on the board of a number of nonprofit organizations that do regional ag support here, and those organizations are supported by USDA grants. So the grants are serving our communities. Um, they're just not making it all the way to the farmers. Mm -hmm. So the difference between the board that I'm on and my own farm is that the board has dedicated grant writers and a staff that's accustomed to the process and knows about weighted um you know, all of, all of the intricacies of, of these grants that is a culture unto themselves. Whereas the farmers, as you can see, we're all competent, educated people. So it's not that it's too complicated. It's just that we are very, very busy. Um, you know, we're, we're doing 10 jobs as it is. And then just fitting in that like two days of grant writing, you know, it just doesn't happen a lot of the time. So, so part of it is just lack of time um, dedicated to the kind of, uh, bureaucratic process. And part of it is also just that the reimbursement part is a little bit, um, it, the access to bear, it's a barrier to access. We, a lot of farms just don't have the cash flow to make those matches or those reimbursements. And so it's just not worth applying. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, my, the, the nonprofit was, has been, I think this year funded by mil a million dollars. And my farm last year, we got five thousand dollars for a CFAP or something like that. So, so there is a huge discrepancy between what actually makes it to the farms and what supports our nonprofit colleagues. I think that Great. I'd like to. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's really helpful, Miss Miss Cooper. Um, thank you so much for, for that question. Um, as you mentioned, we've, we've applied for some programs, um, specifically with, with LAMP programming. Uh, just one thing that I've observed anecdotally is um, that some of the, the more rural supply chain focused projects, um, there's just not an understanding um, on the review side of, of what those rural economies and supply chains look like. Um, and, and even though 30 pages sounds like a lot, it's really hard to succinctly describe what is going on um, in, in 30 pages to someone who may not be familiar with your rural, rural community or, or what that supply chain looks like. Um, so I think, you know, having a representative review panel is important um, and, and also reviewers that can critically look at the impact directly to farmers in a meaningful way from these programs, um, you know, just to, to echo um, what my fellow witness shared. Great, thank you so much. I'm unfortunately gonna run out of time, but um, I just wanted to thank Jonathan and Kelly Shannon. I thought you uh, really appreciate your testimony and, and so many of the things that you mentioned up about having uh, more locally grown foods in our school lunch program, the real challenge people have with uh, lack of slaughterhouses and meat processing capacity, loan access. Um, and uh, you know, I just wish you all the success. I won't be here for a second question, but really, I, I appreciate it. You, you you laid out a lot of the really important things, and um, good luck with your far, flower operation. I, I know there's opportunities there as well. So thank you for being with us, all of you today, and thank you to our friend from the Virgin Islands. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Very I yield much. back, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Ms. Pingree. Uh, I note that specifically Mr. Shannon as well as Mr. Brown talked about the issues with loan rather than. You know, Mr. Dale Brown talked about reimbursement, and I think that's something we really need to work on uh, to provide access to these farmers for the financing that they need to be able to be successful and uh, support our food supply in this country so that we can once again become the number one producers of our own food. Uh, at this time, I call on uh, Congressman Davis of Illinois. Five minutes to you. No Thank smart you. remarks. <laughs> 
Well, thank you, Madam Chair and Ranking Member Barrett. I, I, I do have to express my displeasure, Madam Chair. I, yes. I thought this was going to be a field hearing in your district. Oh. But instead, we're stuck here in the- uh, Why don't we do that Washington. in February? That's the appropriate time for the Committee on Agriculture to come to the Virgin Islands. I like that, and let's <laughs> plan that. But thank you for having this very important hearing today. And actually, I, I'm honored to follow my friend and co-chair of the House Organic Caucus, Ms. Pingree, on this panel. And, you know, I appreciate the perspective that organic farmers bring to this conversation. And as we look to move past the pandemic and overcome obstacles that have challenged and threatened our supply chains, uh, including weather and cybersecurity, among others, we must identify solutions within existing programs that strengthen our supply chains and prioritize food security as a is really a matter of national security. I've, I've been a major advocate of organic farmers, not only because of the consum consumer choice aspect, uh, but to ensure a level playing field for organic farmers and also maintain consumer confidence in the integrity of the organic label. My question is actually for Ms. Cooper. Uh, as an organic farmer, what are some of the biggest challenges you face, particularly as it relates to the need for strong organic standards in the marketplace to live up to that commitment of possessing the USDA organic seal? Um, that, that's a, a really wonderful question and, and something um, that uh, we've been really dealing with here locally. Um, the, the peanut cooperative is the, the only group of certified organic peanut and, and other commodity producers um, in our region. Uh, historically, organic peanuts are not produced in the southeast or in Georgia, um, and so, you know, for us, it's been new for the farmers as well as for the certifiers, and there's been a, lear a learning curve there. Um, I think that um, having uh, certifying bodies that can work with growers as well as with our respected land grant institutions that provide recommendations for production, you know, both in conventional and in organic production to understand the system. Um, you know, that at times there are um, arbitrary aspects that may work in other regions or with other crops that specifically don't work in the Southeast or in peanut productions in particular. Um, also, I, I, uh, it's been very hard for us to incentivize folks to get certified when we can't certify the supply chain. There is just not a scale appropriate supply chain and um, folks that are scale appropriate, there's no incentive or support for them to go through the certification process. That's been a huge barrier. You cannot grow organic acreage without growing the organic processing, the organic supply chain that follows or else you just lose that premium and then there's no incentive. Um, and then lastly, uh, one of the things that the cooperative aims to do through our mentorship and beginning farmer program is to just offer the technical as assistance to growers that are going through this for the first time. Um, we've had both beginning farmers and experienced conventional farmers that in are interested in diversifying their markets come to us with all sorts of questions and having, uh, you know, targeted opportunities for cooperative agreements or technical assistance dollars for folks on the ground familiar with these systems, familiar with the process to offer that support, I think is is really, really critical. And, and we have some of that here, but um, certainly not enough to meet the demand. Well, I, I appreciate your comments and you actually answered my next question about how strong organic standards translate into better resiliency. Uh, but we all know the demand for organic products is going to increase uh, in areas mostly where they don't grow organic products or non-organic products. And due to this increased demand, I know that many uh, that are in your position are, are worried about uh, foreign products that may come into our country that do not even come close to meeting the organic label standards that are put in place. Uh, can you offer just your thoughts on some of those concerns if you have them? Sure. You know, we've we faced that certainly um, because there's not a lot of organic production here, um, there's just a limited supply and the, um, the difference in that supply uh, is coming from international markets um, that typically can offer things at a cheaper price. And, and so then those efforts here locally, um, you know, it, it can be hard to compete with that. Um, and, and so of, of course, you know, we, um, 
you know, not even specific to Georgia or the Southeast, but just in general, then the national production volume is not meeting the national demand and to really um, uplift and, and um, promote the consumption and purchase of those domestically produced products, you know, both conventional and organic, we have high standards of sustainability um, across the board. And I, I think I'm really valuing those domestic domestically produced products is, is very important for the industry as a whole, certainly for organic specifically. Well, thank you. I, I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Um, at this time, we'll call on Salud Kabarhal of California for his five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and thank you to all the witnesses uh, that took time to join us today. Local and regional food systems are critical for both rural economies and addressing food insecurity in the United States, which skyrocketed during the COVID-19 pandemic. In my district, these markets give area residents access to fresh and nutritious foods while supporting the local economy. Public investments in local food systems have proven broadly successful and need further upscaling and technical support in order to reach more people. Ms. Kennedy, what sort of additional investments in terms of funding, technical assistance, and outreach can we include or look into to assist and expand local and regional markets? And what lessons can we take from the success and flexibility of smaller operations to apply to the larger food supply chain in the United States? Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Um, I, I would like to echo my fellow witnesses, um, the Shannons, talking about a lack of adequate processing um, for, for slaughter and um, packaging of protein. Um, in our rural and neighborhoods, there's very few processing centers and there becomes a bottleneck quickly. Um, so if we want to scale up at all on anything, whether it's dairy or meat or veggies um, prepackaged for schools or institutional work, we need this sort of mid-sized um, post-harvest processing facilities. Um, we also need support in the supply chain in terms of trucking. Um, one of the other congressmen mentioned that trucking and boxes are very expensive. In my, in my CSA, we spend um, about 50% of our gross on trucking. Um, and so that doesn't leave a lot for the farmers. <laughs> so, so yeah, if, you know, the, the larger um, ag, or, or ag competitors are getting subsidies in, in trucking, they're getting subsidies in their, you know, they have contracts with schools to provide local school systems with beef. Um, none of us small farms have those. We also don't have crop um, insurance. So if, if we're an organic diversified small crop, a small farm, we don't have, we don't get reimbursed if there's a weather event and we lose our, our crops. Um, so all of these sorts of support that is that the, our larger brethren are receiving, um, it would be really wonderful if that were directed to the small, more resilient, more, um, you know, flexible farms such as ourselves that can pivot on a dime change our models, work with it, whatever situation is at hand. And that's increasingly important in these, um, in our climate uncertainty and in our current climate. Um, so I think that, that those are some ideas that off the top of my head. Thank you, Ms. Kennedy. And certainly as we look to start working on the Farm Bill next year, we certainly need to take into consideration your input because we should do more to extend those benefits to smaller, uh, companies such as the ones that you are referencing and the need to uh, ensure that you're getting your share of support as well. Uh, the organic industry has proven to be an economic driver in my Central Coast District and in the United States. However, I'm aware that farmers face steep challenges and barriers when seeking to transition to organic production and maintain certification. Organic farming communities and the resulting co-benefits depend on farmers having access to handling, processing, and distribution infrastructure and market opportunities. I'm thankful to see that the USDA has recently announced additional grant funding for the Value Added Products Grant Program. Ms. Cooper, as a producer of Value Added Products, have you been able to take advantage of that program? 
And has it worked? Has it worked for you? Um, the, the value added producer program in particular, we have a, a pending application for that. So fingers crossed, my answer will be yes in a, in a couple months. But it, you know, originally it was not something that we were looking at just because of the fifty percent reimbursement. Um, you know, we faced a huge bottleneck this past year. We couldn't make sales because our processing wasn't up to have our product ready to get it to market. So we just didn't have the cash flow um, to, you know, spend $10 to get $5 back. It just didn't work for us. So when that COVID relief came out and there was the, the 10% um, cost share requirement, that's really what attracted us to go for it. And, and hopefully it's something that will really allow us to tap into some of our um, currently untapped markets. Thank you very much. Uh, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'd like to thank and acknowledge the presence of the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Thompson, and yield to him at this time for his five minutes. Thank you, sir. Well, good morning, and thank you, Chair Plaskett, uh, ranking member Baird, for, for holding today's hearing. Uh, uh, incredibly important. i also like to thank our witnesses for taking time to be here today and, and their willingness to share their stories and experiences with us. I think everyone can agree that this past year and a half, has been unprecedented, and our small local producers have been on the front lines working to make sure that consumers, families, uh, maintain abundant access to safe and affordable food. The uh, hearing their stories is important. Uh, while we, and while not the purpose of the hearing, I do like to think that we have an opportunity for some oversight. You know, the Farm Bill includes several programs designed to help beginning and small producers and, and develop local agricultural markets, including the, the Beginning Farmer and Rancher Development Program and the Local Agricultural Market Program. Um, you know, the interactions between our witnesses, consumers, communities, and a department will inform where we need to go from here. And I think I'm, I'm most excited about that. Uh, so thanks again to Chair Plaskett and Ranking Member Baird for calling this hearing and to our witnesses for being here. And uh, my, uh, my question is directed to Ms. Kennedy. Um, you know, thank you uh, uh, for, for what you do. You know, you talked a bit about the, the Farmers to Families Food Box Program. Um, you know, I had a chance to obviously uh, see a lot of that in distribution, uh, talking with producers that were providing uh, the... Um, you know, the, the, the foods to include in that, whether it was dairy or meat, fruits, vegetables. Um, and USDA was able to deliver over 173 million food boxes to families in need before it was abruptly ended by the Biden administration. Um, while other pandemic-related assistance programs remain in place. Now, in your testimony, you mentioned the need to continue this type of support and provide a few recommendations. So for my own edification, I want to check with you. Do you agree with that decision by USDA, specifically, I guess, by Secretary Vilsack, mm -hmm. to, uh, to terminate this program? Um, I, I feel like, in my experience, I wasn't really able to access the food box program. So it didn't affect my business. Um, I'm at a scale that's a little bit smaller, so I wasn't really considered as a producer. So like Ms. Cooper, I created my own food box program with my local constituency and we supplied our local pantries and um, our local food relief organizations. I think that food relief is still needed. I think that a program like the food box program should still exist. I think if I would, um, this new program, I'd make sure that small scale producers could participate. Um, and that it's because right now, because the food box program has, has ended, it's a small scale producers that are taking up the slack, but we don't have the funding to support um, our efforts. Yeah, the, uh, the, the uh, farm to family food box seemed like it was a, a real win win, right? I mean, it was First of all, with the dis disruption of the food supply chain, because like well, well over 60% of of meals were eaten in restaurants prior to this pandemic, and all of a sudden the, there was a processing packaging issue, and so this this allowed first of all our families who are most in need, uh, you know, economically those especially those who overnight were told by their governors you're not allowed to go to work, you have to stay in your house, you uh, you you can't work your job. Um, and, and for the farmers, too, to, to be able to have a, a market. It really seemed like a, um, just a, an effective tool. And you put on top of that, the emphasis was on fresh, fresh foods. 
Um, you know, all, all nutrition is welcome, but certainly that when you look at fruits and be vegetables and uh, uh, dairy and meat, uh, it's just the best of all worlds. I don't know if any of the other witnesses have any experience, any thoughts on the farm to family food boxes. Certainly in what time I have left, would love to hear from you as well. Bill Brown from St. Croix. Uh, Rep. Thomas, most of these uh, programs are not available to the Virgin Islands. So that even make it harder for us to participate. So these are actually missed opportunities to farms here in the territory. And there was nothing coming from USDA, whether through rural development, FSA, or NRCS, okay, that's all the programs that we have here. Um, as in reference to the producer grant, that is time consuming for any producer to, to provide. And there's not a collective on island that can actually help to mitigate that, that problem. So therefore, we are totally on the other side of the fence as small producers. So our local Department of Agriculture is practically absent. And during the pandemic, it was even more so. So that in itself has put us at a disadvantage here in the territory. And definitely if USDA and some of these programs could, um, could contribute to the development of, the, of um, food boxes, during a, during a time of crisis, that would be adequate. However, um, we're still faced with about cultural and customarily uh, traditional foods that we try to produce locally. And for those um, programs, what they were asking for and what was not maintained is uh, a, a program to actually meet this need. Thank you. Very good. Mr. Brown, Ms. Kennedy, thank you so much for your insight. Madam Chair, my time has long expired. That's all right. Uh, for the ranking member of the committee, you, you get leniency in, in more ways than one. Thank you for being here with us. Uh, the next member is Congresswoman Kirkpatrick. Thank you, Chairwoman. I, I really thank you for having this hearing. I. I come from a multi-generational family of ranchers in northern Arizona. We, we had an enormous ranch um, and ran a lot of cattle. And, and I just assumed as a kid that they would always be there. So, um, you know, it's interesting to me that, that times have changed. So anyway, um, my question is for Mr. Shannon. Um, you know, livestock producers are serving local markets, often have a difficult time getting a market ready product produced, requiring meat slaughtering and processing, as well as aggregation of local meat products for sale at the wholesale market. So, so can you describe some of the challenges facing local meat producers and how that impacts business decisions? Yes, thank you for that question. Uh, one of the biggest things that we face at this time, we, we've been using a USDA inspected processor for many years and ha had a great working relationship. So through the pandemic, uh, slaughtering spots were not an issue for us since we had that long standing relationship. Uh, where it comes into is adequate uh, storage after that processing, uh, because of course we cannot move all that product within a week or so. So that storage capacity needs to be there. Um, and looking through uh, COVID-19, nobody in the county or surrounding area had that capacity to store uh, what was being processed uh, to keep up with demand. So that is one of the, one of the issues we face. Uh, another one, uh, I mentioned this, in my written testimony, uh, costs have risen uh, because of the supply chain issues. Um, and of course, those costs do not get absorbed by the processors. That was passed right on to the local farmers and producers. Uh, we experienced a, a large increase because um, 
sanitation products, PPE was not available and that price was up. Those, those have been passed on to us and we're still waiting for that to be returned or rewind to pre-COVID uh, pieces. So those are, those are some of the um, adequate, reliable and economical processing and storage are some of our biggest uh, issues that we face. Thank you for your answer. You know, it's, it's ranching is hard enough <laughs> as it is in the best of circumstances. So um, thank you for, for staying with it and, and, and for what you do. We, we, we need you to be in the, we need you to be in the business and, and you've got my full support in any way I can help. Uh, it's just, I get it. Like I said, from the bottom of my heart, and uh, it's not easy. So, um, you know, as we saw with COVID-19, the supply chain breakdown occurred through multiple sectors. As this committee works to strengthen the local food supply chain and prepare for future disruptions, what farm bill programs do you think would help you and the farmer members you build resilience and what additional support could help you all strengthen the market access. That's for Ms. Cooper, Ms. Cooper. Oh, okay. Sorry, do you want me to repeat that? Um, I, I, I think I, I've got it. Um, so uh, we, I, we're really, um, our biggest thing right now is, is the um, just the lack of rural infrastructure that's scale appropriate. Um, you know, we're in the breadbasket of our, our state, the heart of agricultural production. There are amazing efficiencies and technologies, um, and and they're all just at a scale that's a little bit bigger than um, where small farmers are, uh, where certified organic production is. So um, scale appropriate, certainly. Um, and then if the, the other biggest challenge for us is, um, of course, the, the biggest piece of a supply chain is, is the supply. Um, and while we have so many farmers that are, are interested in, in working with us, um, and we really see this as an opportunity for beginning farmers, um, it, it's a it's a leap. Um, as a, as a beginning farmer myself, you know I've I've really been lucky to have the mentorship and, and the marketing opportunity. Um, but I lease land, and um, it's a year to year lease, and so it's hard to make a the you know specialized equipment investments. And so we're also looking at opportunities like shared equipment um, and, and other benefits of, of cooperative farming that will help bring those farmers along and actually build the supply as well. And that's it. beginning farmer and rancher is really critical for that. Yeah, th thank you so much. I mean, you know, for my generation, we didn't, it was hard work. <laughs> we didn't want to do it. So we all went to college and became professionals, but um, my children want to go back into ranching. So, so we'll see how that, how that all shakes up. But, you know, I thank you. My time is up and, and I yield back. Thank you very much. Um, our next witness is Ms. Fishbach. Ms. Fishbach, your time. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And I appreciate uh, being able to uh, participate in the hearing today. It's been very informative. But um, I, I had read in some of the written testimony about the application process for the USDA um, being rather burdensome and, um, and very heavy on paperwork, things like that. I was wondering if maybe each of the producers could uh, talk a little bit about each of the witnesses could talk a little bit about how we might improve that process for them and do a more outreach. I, I believe the Shannons talked about the outreach and, um, but if there was something that we could do to improve that process. So I don't know who we want to start with if, if maybe the Shannons would like to, would like to start. Sure, thank you for that question. Um, Again, our relationship only started last year with our local USDA office. Um, that process was easy. But in the past week or two, looking through some of the grants and programs, um, it comes down to a time issue. And that's been mentioned before. Uh, simplicity of form, simplicity of uh, getting paperwork back and forth electronically the, this day and age is essential. Um, we're busy raising livestock, kids, running businesses, 
uh, there's not time to sit up for multiple hours looking through paperwork, gathering everything. Uh, so whether that outreach is having someone come out, visit the farm, fill out that paperwork alongside you while they're while you're uh, working and producing. Um, but yes, yeah, some simplification through technology and having that paperwork back and forth uh, would be beneficial. Thank you. And, and Ms. Kennedy? I agree um, with the streamlined application. Also, uh, at the timing of the application, as I mentioned before, to maybe winter months when we're a little bit less busy, or at least the vegetable producers. Um, also, ag again, just incentive. You know, if, if, if we have the reimbursement and matching needs, then people just don't bother applying. So if you were to, were to eliminate or decrease those, then more people would apply. Um, and I think also just making sure there's support for people that don't have, that can't go find these um, online, you know, that we have, we still have rural broadband issues as has also been mentioned. So more outreach, more, more technical assistance on applications, more, um, especially for BIPOC and underserved communities. And, and if any of the other witnesses, I don't have everybody on my screen. So if any of the other witnesses have something they'd like to uh, bring up. I'd love to also echo uh, the, the cost share, especially for smaller farmers and in small farm businesses, that cash flow and those cost share requirements can be quite burdensome. Um, one, one thing that I would also just like to, to mention very briefly, um, in, in Georgia, there has been some effort um, in, in different parts of our state and with the support of our Department of Agriculture to create hubs um, for small farm businesses to seek some professional services. Um, and we've, I think it's really innovative and, and something that could really benefit small farms and small farm businesses is, is kind of these incubator hubs that offer some of these services, which would be led at a local level, but could, could definitely benefit from um, federal support, certainly. Thank you very much. And I don't know, I believe and Mr. Brown, Dave Brown, Dave Brown from the Virgin Islands. But most of these programs that are spoken of by the other witnesses are unavailable to the Virgin Islands because we only have rural development and that requires uh, uh, housing or affordable housing uh, and the small minority producer grant. You have FSA that is basically loans and programs that require disaster and NRCS was a quality <laughs> program. So these other programs are not available. We are basically two to three miles away from the office itself. And that's an easy trip. However, most of these other programs are not available in the territory. Well, and, and I thank everyone for their input. And just to, with my last 30 seconds, I'm just gonna say that I think one of the big themes that we hear, um, you know, and I, I, I hear the regulation, but that broadband issue, I think we hear about that in every single committee that uh, every ag committee that we hear about because it is so vital and uh, we, are, we absolutely need to make sure that we are working on that. But I appreciate all the input from the witnesses and thank you all for being here today and I yield back. Thank you very much, Ms. Fishbach. Uh, now time to Mr. Lawson of Florida. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, to you and the, the ranking member. It's a real privilege uh, uh, to welcome uh, everyone to uh, this committee today. Now, before I answer my question, and my qu first question will go to the Shannon. Uh, do y'all still use the, uh, the Omni uh, in the term and climate and everything? I grew up in the country, and when we was farming, that's one of the things uh, that we use in the special car, the Omni. Uh, but I'm going to ask you a question, and someone and everybody else can uh, can respond to that because I think the almanac is still good today. Uh, the question is direct to the channel, but anyone uh, may answer if uh, we have the time. As as you know, Congress and the USDA uh, support a, a number of programs that provide direct support to local agricultural markets and and producers. However, uh, some farmers have little. Uh, to no knowledge of these opportunities available there. What are some uh, ways uh, that Congress and the USDA can better support the outreach uh, to uh, these farmers? And just listen to you all 
uh, the, this morning, I thought it was incredible, uh, the adjustment that you had to make uh, during the pandemic. Yes, uh, to your first question, uh, we, we no longer use the farm, Farmer's Almanac. Uh, it's just more <laughs> word, <laughs> word of mouth from more, uh, shall we say, seasoned farmers in the area that have been around and seen other <laughs> things. So, uh, okay. you know, we, we don't even have a, pay, a, a current paper copy sitting anywhere at home anymore. So, um, <laughs> and, and you're exactly correct. Uh, other witnesses here today are talking about programs that I have never heard of in my life before. And we've been at this uh, 15 years. So getting that word out that these programs are available, these opportunities are available is the struggle. I don't know if that's starting um, with the youth loans, uh, reaching out to high school ag classes to uh, show them where that is, see the opportunities there, uh, reaching out to kids and FFA that those programs are available is beginning and, and young farmers. Um, again, someone in the county, in the, in the local office going out and stopping at farms that they know have, uh, are producing produce, livestock, whatever it may be in our region and saying, hey, are you aware? Here's a handout, a page of what's available to your local area. Uh, but no, there was, there was no knowledge. And uh, again, a lot of these things that are being spoken of I'm going to have to go home and look up and, and see if those are beneficial to us. But uh, that outreach is super important for, in a face-to-face -face environment. That's amazing. Anyone else care to comment? Because we say we have a lot of programs. And so it'll be interesting to see, uh, and I'm glad Ms. Shannon shared it, but anyone else uh, on the panel would like to comment? Well, Dale Brown, Virgin Islands. Uh, the Farmer's Almanac, we can actually produce all year round, so uh, it's not really used by most farmers. For those older farmers, yes, they will use it because there are above ground days and below ground days. And if we wait on above ground days to plant above ground, we won't plant anything. If we have to wait on the below ground days and to plant below ground, we won't plant anything below ground. So we can plant in any conditions once we have adequate water supply and knowing the crop and what the crop takes to actually come to fruition. Ms. Cooper. Um, Representative Lawson, I'd like to address your, your second question. Um, we here in Georgia have uh, uh, an outreach arm um, called Team Agriculture Georgia that is specifically aims to provide outreach to beginning and, and underserved producers in the state and, and um, convenes uh, various arms of USDA, you know, from NRCS to rural development to, to FSA um, to in, engage all of them collectively um, and provide direct outreach. Um, I think some of the challenges with challenges with that are certainly um, funding so that it, it's not just adding additional work to folks here on the in the ground that are already um, working really hard um, and, and really dedicating funding to, to um, you know, ensure that outreach is effective. And of course, this past year has been really difficult for the in-person engagement, but those in-person opportunities are, are really invaluable. Okay, thank you. Madam Chair, before I yield back, I'm going to share the almanac with you because it might be before your time. <laughs> I'm not even going to respond to you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mr. Lawson. Ms. Cooper, can, may I ask uh, the program that you talked about in Georgia um, that assists underserved areas, is that uh, an organization that was created by the state or by farmers themselves? And how is that staff and funded? Um, the one I just mentioned? Yes, yes, ma'am. Um, it, it's... Um, it is uh, not farmers. It's it's a USDA outreach arm. Um, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of the, the technical term for it, but um, one of a local RCND is is actually the the funding body. So they've been seeking small grants, you know, cooperative mm -hmm. agreements within RCS, other opportunities for that. Um, you know, it, it began just kind of as a, a coalition of, of the different agencies talking to each other to identify opportunities, but it's really that extra funding, you know, to have someone to run outreach programs, to ramp up our website, to 
you know, um, provide a newsletter with upcoming grant opportunities and, and that sort of thing. It's those extra resources that go into those locally led projects to make them, you know, have have some teeth and stand alone um, and not just become extra work for, for agencies that are already stretched so thin, I think has really made the difference. Um, if you'd like to look it up, it's, it's Team Agriculture Georgia. Um, and it, it kind of spells out the, um, the structure and, and how, um, how it operates. Thank it's you. It's been Thank really you. beneficial for, for our, you know, as, for GOPA to look towards that as a resource. Thank you very much for that information. I, um, our next um, member to question is Ms. Letlow. Chair Plaskett, Ranking Member Baird, members of the subcommittee and witnesses, thank you for taking the time to discuss supply chain resiliency especially focused on our small scale farms. Our farmers and ranchers are the cornerstone of food production in America. Many of our rural communities are fueled by the perseverance of our local agriculture producers, large and small. However, over the last year, we have all seen and experienced the impact that the COVID-19 pandemic had on our essential food supply chains. As discussed here today, the farm to market sector faced many challenges presented by the pandemic small produce and crawfish farmers in Louisiana lost access to traditional direct market opportunities, which ultimately left them to explore new avenues for distribution and profitability. Mr. Shannon, your testimony is one that I've often heard across my district, a young beginning small farmer seeking opportunities to grow and expand into, into new markets. Can you further share with the subcommittee how Shannon Family Farms is adapting to customer demand and any plans to maximize on newfound opportunities for local agriculture markets through USDA? I sure can. I'm gonna let uh, Kelly talk on this one a little bit here. Um, again, husband and wife team, we each have our own kind of what we're responsible for in the, in the farm. Sure. So I'll let her go on this one. All right. Um, basically, we have continued to explore new markets through starting with the farmer's markets and then just some direct consumer with people that we knew. Then um, we got together with some other farmers and developed Four Seasons Local Market, which is where we came together with those other um, farmers from our community and decided that we were going to put together a retail space that would be available to our customers year round. Basically, um, in Indiana, our farmers markets run from, you know, basically May until October and then close. And the question was, you know, where do our people go after that October timeframe until we're available the next May? And we found, you know, our customers basically just disappeared. So I assume that they go back to using just our basic grocery stores. Um, by establishing Four Seasons Local Market, we were able to draw those customers in year round and uh, create that space so that they could get local foods provided to them without as many restraints as there are like visiting the farm or having to drive multiple places to get things. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. I have a whole follow up question. This past year, many small businesses were forced to close some temporarily and some permanently. Uh, Mr. Shannon, you said that the Four Seasons local market has had continuous growth each year. How did the pandemic impact your operations at Four Seasons local market, and what are the plans for growing the market as we near the end of the pandemic? Sure, I, I can speak on that a little bit. Um, mentioned before, record, record sales through March, April, May, um, things started to come back to normal. Uh, we did benefit by a lot of those customers sticking around. Uh, but a majority returned to their normal buying habits uh, as supplies increased uh, at the store. Um, so our focus is how can we work together, large and small, to give folks options uh, in every community? And, that, and that's what we're struggled with. We're kind of serving as an incubator. Uh, we stepped out on the ledge, took the risk to put the capital in to have a store. So other local producers, very small in our area, are being able to take advantage of putting their product into the store at a very reasonable price uh, to get their name out there and try to grow that next generation of, of local food producer. Um, so in the question of USDA, that was all self-funded, mm -hmm. but having those opportunities to capital heavy investments, uh, starting that and giving other people options like that uh, would be very helpful. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mr. Shannon and Kelly, for sharing with me today. Um, I yield back the remainder of my time. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Letlow, and thank you for getting 
Ms. Uh, Shannon to uh, give us some information as well. Uh, Mr. Bacon, you now have five minutes. Thank you, and I'm gonna start off by sharing uh, Rodney Davis's sentiments about the Virgin Islands. It's, uh, Megan's Bay is the prettiest place in the world, I think. Uh, to the panelists, thank you all for being here. I just wanna start off just by saying, you know, America uh, is the strongest nation in the world, and we have lots of reasons for it. Part of it's our energy independence, which we've gotta protect. But here, we, we just gotta restate the, the fact that we're so blessed to also have agriculture independence. We can feed our entire country and we can feed much of the world and our agriculture is a national treasure that we gotta protect. So my first question is really to all the panelists or those who wanna participate. A few of you mentioned in your testimony that you're either utilizing or looking at establishing e-commerce as a tool to boost your sales. Of course, e-commerce requires strong rural broadband and many of our rural areas lack this connection. Can any of you uh, speak to how critical rural broadband is for not only for e-commerce, but for the rest of your operations as well. Thank you. I would, I would love to speak to this. I, I live in Charlottesville, um, New York, which is in the middle of nowhere. And we don't have broadband internet. We also don't have cell phone service. So I'm speaking to you over satellite right now. And I run, I run two businesses, my farm and this CSA, which is an e-commerce platform. Um, via satellite. Anytime it rains, it goes down. Anytime, you know, it, it's the moon, it's Tuesday and the moon is a certain color, the satellite goes down. So it's really a huge challenge to, uh, to run both of those businesses on satellite internet. And I cannot stress um, enough how important broadband is for our, our world. Well, you make a great point. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, anybody else? Sure, uh, Jonathan Shannon here. Uh, as more programs, anything from our accounting to our inventory, everything is cloud-based these days. And the struggle is finding that reliable broadband to run those businesses. Uh, we were blessed through the COVID-19 pandemic that we had an e-commerce site set up to reach those customers that were not getting out and that we can make those deliveries to the doorstep. Uh, Again, all broadband heavy requirement uh, that's not available. Uh, we're blessed today. We came up to town per se, and they're in the city owned co working studio, and the Chamber of Commerce has allowed us to have reliable internet today to speak to you because that was not available at home. Thank you very much. Anyone else? I'll echo the Shannons. I also had to come into town to our uh, little, uh, you know, I mentioned. A small business incubators is, is the only place I can get reliable internet. Um, in addition to some of the, the e-commerce, um, something that we also face here in, in my work with the Soil and Water Conservation District is implementing a lot of on-farm technologies that really improve efficiencies. Um, a lot of those are becoming cloud-based, app-based, um, require broadband. So, you know, in addition to just basic communication, serving customers, uh, there's, there's also a missed opportunity with farm efficiencies and being able to implement new technologies actually on the farm as well. Well, thank you so much. I got a follow-up question for Mr. Dale Brown. Uh, Mr. Brown, in your testimony, you mentioned your work with the Bridging the Gap summer program that aims to educate kids between the ages of seven and 18 about agriculture in the Virgin Islands. I'm a firm believer in giving our students firsthand experiences on the farm to help them understand where their food comes from. Can you talk a little more about your work in this program? Thank you. Yes, I can. Um, Bridging the Gap has been one of our focus because there, there aren't any agricultural program. And only after recently, our land grant institution is trying to reinstitute agriculture back into, into its academic format. Now, since 1984, there has been no uh, agricultural science thought at a land grant institution. So we have taken it on, taken it on, on ourselves to actually begin through summer programs and through the workforce development from our local department of labor to have uh, students be brought in and be shown different areas and all aspects of island agriculture and how we can function as an economic development tool and career building just as well. Uh, presently, we have 10 students, 
to working in, in the office on the farm and eight out in the field. One of the things that we do with these students is actually take them through different career levels at the University of the Virgin Islands and also teach them the practical and the science of growing food in our, on the farm. Now, that's one aspect. The other aspect has been uh, students between seven and 18, which engage in our summer program. And that is in, including uh, culinary, uh, working side by side with the older students and also providing uh, lunches from them that comes directly from the farm. So they are able to actually see the different aspect of agriculture growing and that not all of their food actually comes from out of the supermarket right. from abroad and giving them that self value that they can look at and choose in a career from them. Thank you so much for your food. insight. Uh, that's outstanding. And Madam Chair, I'll yield back. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> Before we adjourn today, I invite the ranking member to share any closing remarks he may have at this time. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. You know, I think we both appreciate uh, all of our uh, witnesses here today as well as our member participation. And I think, you know, consumers are becoming uh, increasingly interested in where their food comes from. And so with the discussions that we've had here, I think we may be uh, shedding some light on an opportunity for young farmers to get involved and bring them into the agricultural industry. So with that, Madam Chair, I look forward to the opportunity to work with you in the future. Thank you so much, Mr. Ranking Member. As we wrap up this first hearing of the Subcommittee on Biotechnology, Horticulture, and Research, I would first like to thank all of our witnesses for their testimony and their comments and answers. The expertise and knowledge shared today is invaluable as we work to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic and build back better. Today we heard about the importance of local agricultural markets, the role of urban agriculture, um, special steps that can be taken to improve the resiliency of our local, national, and global food supplies. I think that this subcommittee hearing has shown a tremendous level of bipartisanship. And I'm really grateful to the ranking member for facilitating that. Uh, all of our witnesses showed the even the range of issues, uh, the range of locations that they are, all share so many similar issues in farming uh, and overcoming the COVID pandemic. And I wanna thank them all for that as well. I'm excited to continue to work with our panel of witnesses and the members of this committee to make sure that our small producers and local agricultural markets have the tools that they need to best serve their communities. Under the rules of the committee, the record of today's hearing will remain open for 10 calendar days to receive additional material, supplemental written responses from the witnesses to any of the questions posed by the members. The hearing of the Subcommittee on Biotechnology, Horticulture and Research is adjourned. <laughs>